I'm Richard Taylor from Marquette University, and uh, together with my colleague Andrea Robilio at the Catholic University in Leuven, uh, we present to you this course on Thomas Aquinas, Metaphysics. And today we have our ninth class. This lecture is for the ninth uh, class, which is October 17 of 2013. The first lecture then is on Aquinas. And uh, today the first lecture is on Aquinas on God and Creation with focus on the first article, and that is the Commentary on Sentences, distinct, uh, Book 2 of the Sentences, Distinction 1, Question 1, Article 1. For the most part, that will be the concern in this lecture. The second of the lecture will concern Article 2, which I think is a bit meatier philosophically. At any rate, uh, let's proceed. The two articles that we're examining in Class 9 today raise a multitude of fascinating philosophical questions, directly or indirectly. Uh, the most interesting of which, as I indicated just a moment ago, are prompted by the uh, second article <clears throat> to be considered here, whether anything can go forth ex jure post from God into being by, crea by creation. We'll see in that text something we've already seen, and that is that Aquinas follows Avicenna very, very carefully. He had a very good understanding of the arguments of Avicenna's metaphysics, and he puts them certainly to use uh, in in that article, and somewhat in the first article that we're going to look at in just a couple of minutes. There we'll see that he follows, well, and both we'll see that he follows Avicenna on, on efficient causality and the very notion of creation in ways that were very close to what we've seen already in the De Ante et Essentia. And of course you'll recall in the De Ante et Essentia that Aquinas made a distinction between essence and existence, and of course the question we had then was what kind of di distinction is this? Is this merely a mental distinction or a distinction of reason, or is it a real distinction? We still recall that we saw there that Aquinas uh, assumes that uh, uh, that God is the first being, that is pure being, and in virtue of that he seems to be able to put together an account that allows uh, for a real distinction of essence and existence, or at least points to it. I think the conclusion, at least in my studies, what I came to is that in the Dante de Sensia, he points to it, and it is perhaps to be developed elsewhere. But that's another issue we can take up in class. I'd be delighted to do so. So before we proceed to look at the text, though, I want to call your attention to some important secondary literature that's been indicated on the class uh, website as required or option for the class. There you'll see uh, issues relevant to primary and secondary causality, which we discussed earlier regarding Proclus and the Liber de Causis, which is drawn from the work of Proclus. You'll recall we looked at the first proposition of the Liber de Causis, which is a statement of the doctrine of primary causality. Later in the Liber de Causis, that primary causality is identified as creation. Even if this uh, creative act is by God, and in the use of secondary causes, and in the use of intermediaries by way of creation. Now, uh, approaching the topic today, then uh, I think it would be very valuable for you to have looked at the, the short piece in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy uh, by Kavnig on creation and conservation. It's a starting point, but I didn't find it very satisfactory. I certainly wanted him to go on for perhaps another 15 pages to discuss the issues at stake, but it's a starting point. So if you want to pursue that further, I'd suggest you look at the articles I've already recommended on the website by Fredosa, Quinn, and Craig. These are much more hearty philosophical articles, I think, and, uh, and are very, very important for their philosophical considerations. Uh, for those of you who are somewhat new to this uh, discussion, I would suggest you have a look at uh, Pasnow and Shields in the philosophy of Aquinas in the assigned material there as well. The sorts of issues that come up in these secondary sources are really quite important, and uh, the issue is the uh, conservation, what the nature of creation is, and what the nature of conservation is, and whether the two of them are in fact one thing. And also the issue that arises there, although the terminology is not used in exactly the same way, the issue of concurrentism, and that is that uh, we are able to do things with God, uh, God concurring. So this, the doctrine of Aquinas generally is taken as God is the primary cause of all things that exist, and human beings are secondary causes, and God must always be concurrent or, or in accord with all uh, actions that secondary causes have, and uh, God's uh, causal activity is, in fact, uh, ontologically prior to that of any secondary cause. 
<clears throat> These issues are discussed to some extent in Ferdoso, Quinn, and Craig, and also in Paznow and Shields, and uh, I certainly recommend them to you. But I thought that, in my reading, I thought that De Craig did a rather good job in pointing out the different kinds of creation and uh, in his critique of uh, Ferdosa uh, and Quinn as well. And De Craig distinguishes the various senses of creation as a creation uh, organons, uh, that is, uh, originons, that is, uh, creation continuons, and creation stons. So the first is creation uh, ex nihilo as originating the existence of something. The second is creation continuons, and that is continuous creation. And the third is creation stons. And creation stons here would be something that uh, the universe is in a kind of stable state, uh, and there's a tracing back of the causality of being to a first cause in some way for that stable state so that the universe was always as it is now. There's something very similar to what we find in Avera was in this last notion, this uh, creatio stans, as Craig puts it. But uh, that's something to pursue a bit further. Let's proceed with what we have here uh, today then. So this is the second book of the sentences, Distinction 1, Question 1, Article 1 and it's whether there are many first principles. Aquinas first wants to establish that there is one first principle of all things, and then he wants to proceed to the issue of creation in the second article. And as we shall see in this discussion then, Aquinas, or as you shall see in the readings, Aquinas mentions the Manichaeans at the end of his response. But his contemporary concern here was with the heretical dualist Cathars, active in the 12th to 14th centuries in southern France and northwest Spain, uh, and the Catalonia area, in fact. And their teachings prompted the Albigensian uh, crusade called for by Pope Innocent III, and this was something very close to the heart of Aquinas, since it was a crusade preached by St. Dominic, who founded Aquinas' own order of preachers, the Dominicans, in 1216. So Aquinas certainly has this in mind, and it's a contemporary concern of his. The, the, the quasi-Manichaean approach that the Cathars have uh, in uh, southern France and northwest Spain. So after the, first sense, uh, after the sense of first principle as used in any genus or order, Aquinas says, uh, he, Aquinas uh, indicates clearly that he's focused on the notion of one first principle taken absolutely. So he talks about, as you know from your reading, he talks about things can be first in genus of, of different kinds, but he's uh, primarily concerned with this notion of first principle taken absolutely. One first principle, that is. And he, there are three considerations relevant to this, he says. Uh, and he says, first of all, there's the teleological order of the universe toward, quote, one highest ultimate good which is desired by all. And then the second consideration that he raises in favor of this one first principle is this. He says, the nature of being in things which are in a hierarchy, <clears throat> the nature of being in things which are in a hi hierarchy and such that they are not very... Uh, the very being by which they are. So things are in a kind of a hierarchy, and in that hierarchy only the first is the very being, uh, the very being which it is. Other things have a distinction of essence and existence in them. So you see he's drawing upon the earlier material that he had set forth uh, as well. In fact, um, we'll see uh, that again uh, in just a couple of minutes. So the second continued, and this this is the notion again, that uh, there's a we, the consideration of the nature of being, which are in a hierarchy of things which are in a hierarchy, and which are such that uh, they are not that very being which they have. So they're not uh, completely identical with the being which they have. And that will mean that uh, all creatures are composites of essence and existence and they have being, but they are not identical with being. So they are not the very being that they have. <clears throat> Pardon me. He, and he says the following, quote, Otherwise, being would belong to the concept of each quiddity. As you can see, we're heading into an argument that we've already seen in the Dante. So, otherwise, being would belong to the concept of each quiddity. 
That is false, since the quiddity of any given thing can be understood even without understanding about it, whether it exists. Therefore, it is necessary, we've already seen this in the De Ante Essentia, uh, this is the at least conceptual distinction, perhaps more for Aquinas, uh, here between essence and existence. The quiddity is distinct from the thing existing. Therefore, he continues, it is necessary that they have being from another, essay ab alio then, uh, and it is necessary to reach something, the nature of which is being itself, since otherwise the argument would proceed to an, into infinity. So, given that there is an essence-existence distinction in all things, then it's necessary that we finally reach something in a hierarchy of being that is being itself and does not receive being from another. You can see the Avicennian foundations in this and how Aquinas simplifies Avicenna. Uh, as uh, Hauser mentions, as well in his uh, in his article on the De Ante Decentia and the Avicennian foundations that are present there. Recall then that, that Hauser argues that this is a dialectical account uh, that Aquinas gives. Uh, <clears throat> so Aquinas continues then, quote, This is what gives being to all things. Nor can there be but one, since the nature of entity is of one notion, rationis, in all things according to analogy, for unity of what is caused requires unity per se in the cause. This is the way of Avicenna. So he's quite explicit here. The notion of the distinction of essence and existence and the need to proceed uh, upward towards something that gives being to all things because it is being, it has the nature of entity, uh, and it's uh, and, and there's a certain analogy then and a hierarchy in this because other things have being which they receive from that which is pure being here uh, and uh, so it's very similar to the argument we've already seen in uh, the De Ante Decentia. So uh, that's what I say in the next slide. Uh, this is of course the sort of reasoning we found last week in the De Ante Decentia. and again then the conceptual distinction of being in essence indicates the necessity of there being something which is being itself, since we can't have an infinite regress in this reasoning. And it must be just one, since the nature of entity, natura entis, is of one notion, unius rationis, of one notion in all things according to analogy. For unity of what is caused requires unity per se in the cause. Right? So, uh, cum natura entitatis sit unius rationis in omnibus, secundum analogia. Unitas autum causati requirit unitatem in causa per se. So, that's necessi there's a necessity that the, the, it be there per se in something. And so, the first principle is pure being and being is found in other things as caused by the first principle. So, as we said, as I said then, Aquinas' reasoning is drawn from Avicenna, but earlier in the sentences, since uh, he established these three conclusions that are relevant to this. So, Aquinas is, where we are in the second book of the sentences, Aquinas is also drawing on reasoning, or presuming reasoning, that he established earlier in the first book. And uh, certainly, uh, these, he established these conclusions. First, uh, quote, in God, his very being is his quiddity. That was at the first book of the sentences, Distinction 8, Question 1, Article 1, in the response. And then secondly, God is the being of things as efficient and exemplar cause. That's discussed in the first book of the sentences, Distinction 8, Question 1, Article 2. And the third point, uh, God is ontologically simple is set out in in the first book of the sentences, Distinction 8, Question 4, Article 1, in the response. So these are the foundations on the basis of which Aquinas can uh, assume that there is a real distinction of essence and existence. And he draws on, on some of these same ideas, of course, in the Dante de Sensia, as we've already seen. So it's not at all surprising that Aquinas here assumes that his teaching on the real distinction of essence and existence and God's nature as being itself is part of the argument. It's assumed in the argument, and so it, on the basis of that, his argument follows. Now, the third consideration the, regarding first principles that Aquinas raises here, uh, he says, uh, the third consideration comes from the immateriality of God, 
and he, it is also something that he takes from Avicenna. He says the following then, For it is necessary that the cause moving the heavens be a power not existing in matter, as is proven in Physics 8. So, in Aristotle's Physics 8, he proves that, in fact, for there to be eternal motion, eternal and unchanging motion in the heavens, it's necessary that there be an immaterial entity as a, as a cause of this motion. And Aquinas goes on then, However, in things which are without matter, there can be no diversity except insofar as the nature of one is more complete and existing, and existing in act than the nature of the other. Close quote. So with regard to entities that are in a hierarchy, then we can't have two at the same level in the hierarchy. Avicenna discussed this in detail, indicating that if you had two, if you had two necessary beings, or two gods, then uh, this would be impossible. They would collapse into one another, or they would be they would be contrary to one another. And so Avicenna's dialectical account of that indicated that it's necessary for us to conclude that there is only one necessary being, and that's what Aquinas is drawing upon here. And so in the hierarchy we have we have beings at at uh, in this kind of hierarchy, and at the top there can only be but one. And remember what Aquinas is trying the considerations Aquinas are used is using here are to establish that there is one first principle. So this, again, as I said, is based on Avicenna's discussion of the impossibility of there being two things that are pure being, or the necessary being, as Avicenna would have it. Now, three of the five objections here that Aquinas raises concern the problem of evil, as you'll have noticed in the reading. These are quite interesting. The first objection, objection one, is solved by noting that evil is a negation, not a real being. I want to highlight this because some of the discussions in class have concerned the nature of evil and how Aquinas deals with the nature of evil. So this, this article is quite relevant. Uh, and again, this is the early Aquinas in the commentary on the sentences. The second objection concern, uh, is solved for Aquinas by considering evil as a cause only per accidens. So it's not a per se cause, but only a per accidens cause. Evil is a certain privation and does not name some nature in a positive way, writes Aquinas. Now the third objection, in the, third, in the response to the third objection, Aquinas distinguishes between natural evil and voluntary or blameworthy evil as well. So obviously then only voluntary agents or rational agents are involved in the second. So uh, natural evil is a, is a privation and uh, we're not, I'm not going to go over those texts in detail right now. So this is short, but let this suffice then for uh, the discussion of the uh, second book of the sentences, Distinction 1, Question 1, Article 1. And uh, the next video, Video 9b, will be concerned with the uh, second uh, article of this question, whether anything can go forth, exere posit, from God into being by creation. And as I said, that uh, next uh, uh, next discussion will be a bit more hardy philosophically, I think. But again, we'll see a great deal of Avicenna in what Aquinas is doing. Uh, so we'll pause, uh, we'll stop here, and uh, resume in just a moment or two.